Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Good morning. Okay. One of the things I love about being in the league is when you give. We can't hear you. Ah, uh, when you give folks in the league a time limit, they actually settle down and get their coffee. It's great. So welcome to our annual winter breakfast program. Uh, we have a fascinating speaker in store for you this morning. Uh, but first, I'm Julie Ryan. I'm the president of the Carpet Carlisle League, and I have a little business to conduct. Uh, I would like to begin by recognizing those whose hard work made this event possible. If I miss someone, I will apologize abjectly. But uh, Nancy Bukas and her inside picture and Tebo um, does many, many things, including our beautiful name tags. Um, our membership chair, Ann Hayden, who worked on this program, and our event chair, Stefan Bader, who makes sure that all the details are in place. They have all done an outstanding job. Um, now, I would like to let you know about some upcoming league events. Uh, first, we have continued this year with our First Friday series. Our next First Friday will be on February 7th at 9.15 a.m. and we will return to the new for us location of the West Concord Union Church, which we used in January, for a program on building a middle school for the 21st century. With four speakers, uh, our superintendent, Lori Hunter, who will talk about educational design, Kate Hanley and Matt Root, both experts in sustainability, who will discuss sustainability in schools, and Mike Carroll, uh, the owner's project manager for the middle school building committee who will go over the sequencing of the process from here on. Uh, our own Ruth Lauer will be moderating the discussion. Is Ruth here? Okay, and I hope you can join us. Oops. Okay. Um, one, as you know, we are in the midst of marking the 100 year anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the vote across the United States. This is also the 100th anniversary year of the founding of both the National League of Women Voters and the Massachusetts League. Uh, you should have received a sheet with some dates for events in Concord and Carlisle in observation of the anniversary, uh, but I would like to highlight a couple of items for you. Um, First, I would like to recognize Cindy Nock. Yay. Yay, Cindy. Cindy is the creator of the historical bookmarks and the Yellow Roses, and uh, one of the two members organizing events in Carlisle. The other is Barbara Lewis. Um, I would also like to recognize another author who's with us today, Pam Swing. Back over there, our member who will be giving a lecture next week on her play, I Want to Go to Jail, with co-author Elizabeth DeBonga at Brandeis University. There are flyers for that in the lobby. Um, we also have with us today Freddie Kay, who is leading the state effort. Freddie, where are you? Ah, over there. And is a, a leader at Suffrage 100 in Mass. Um, I'd also like to recognize that we will be marching sometimes this spring, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but today there are women and men gathering across the country once again to march in support of our democracy. And if you want to march, and you're here today, you can go march tomorrow in air at 3 p.m. at Town Hall. Um, other events, our league is co-sponsoring an event on March 14th with the Women's Parish Association, a women's suffrage centennial celebration featuring many interesting speakers, music, food, and opportunities to meet and talk with organizations working today on women's rights, voting rights, and ensuring the continued health of democracy. Um, Diane Pekin is the chair of that, if Diane could wave, and we have flyers also about that event. Uh, the event begins at 6 p.m. and will be held in the Meeting House of First Parish here in Concord. Now for the marching. Our 100th anniversary committee is also gathering league members to participate in two parades this spring. The Concord Patriots Day Parade on April 20th and the Old Home Day Parade in Carlisle on June 20th. 
We would love to have 100 marchers for our 100 years. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby for more information. There are also a couple of sign-up <laughs> sheets that will circulate around. Put your name and your contact info on it, and we will get in touch. There will also be more details in MMN about that and other upcoming anniversary events. One last event to let you know about. Um, this year is also the year for the federal census. And the U.S. League has put out a call to state and local leagues to support the census and to help ensure that everyone in our country is counted. This fall, after our member coffee in September, our league formed a complete count committee, ably co-chaired by Ann Hayden, who is, there we go, and uh, Ellen Quackenbush. They have been hard at work. And I would like to recognize Ellen to tell you a little bit about an upcoming event. Yeah, so um, on January, I'm just gonna yell, so hope you can hear me. On January 26th, the league is sponsoring an event of Harvey Wheeler from two to 4 p.m. to come up with ideas about how to count, how to get um, participation by hard to count community for, uh, or members, such as low income, think open table, or immigrants. And by the way, Emerson is a large, one of their major um, employee uh, demographics is, is folks from Framingham. This year, for the first time, the census is being done online, which opens up the possibility of all of us for helping to um, uh, staff kiosks for a safe and secure census participation. So please consider attending this workshop. There are flyers out front. Also, for those of you who have, uh, maybe you or your family members would like to earn a little extra money, the census is paying $27.50 for people who will be trained to be census takers or kiosk um, managers. So please consider that as well. Uh, flyers out front. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we go on to our featured speaker, uh, we've also been joined today by uh, Representative Tammy Gouveia, who represents us in the 14th Middlesex District, which includes Concord and Carlisle. Uh, and the state Representative Gouveia would like to say a couple words. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, thank you to the league for organizing uh, this event, but also the host of events that you schedule throughout the year and all the activities that you're engaged in. We had a wonderful visit when you came to see me up on Beacon Hill and really appreciate um, all the work that you do here um, at the league. Um, I'm also, you know, just really thrilled uh, to be here, uh, you know, celebrating 100 years. It's really fantastic all the events that have been happening um, throughout the country throughout the year. Um, for those of you who don't know, currently the Massachusetts legislature is um, only 28% are women. And of the over, <clears throat> excuse me, and of the over 10,000 legislators we've had throughout the history of the Massachusetts legislature, only 200 have been women. So we have a long way to go, even though we're here celebrating the fact that we've had the right to vote for 100 years, our government does not reflect the true popula diversity of our population. Throughout the suffragist movement, there have always there were always ongoing debates about who should get the right to vote first. Should it be black men? Should it be white women? Who should be included? Who shouldn't? And if you look at the history, you can see it's a very rich history around conversations around race, gender, and to a certain extent, also class. The intersectional identities of women of color in particular were oftentimes ignored and they were put in a position to have to choose between their race or their gender. The 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870, which is really fantastic, as we know, because it gave African-American men the right to vote. But by the end of the 1870s, so many states, particularly in the South, had started to pass policies to really disenfranchise African-Americans from being able to, to have that right to vote. And so while I'm you know, really incredibly proud of the work so that all the women and men did to get us the right to vote, there's a history that is also important for us to acknowledge and to understand because it impacts the kind of representation that we have up at the State House right now. We have 10 Michaels serving in the State House um, as state reps or state senators, and we have nine Davids. We have six women of color, just six, in a very, very diverse uh, state such as Massachusetts. We have a long way to go. So we can celebrate, but also learn from our history and say, what can we be doing differently? <laughs> and I know that women continue to be at the forefront of doing things differently. We're leading women's marches. We're leading marches for human rights, for immigrants' rights, for workers' rights. 
to make sure that people have food on their table, they have a roof over their head, they have heat in their houses, and they have a way to get from point A to point B. And I want to thank all of you for being part of those efforts because they are what will help us get to the kind of democracy that our forefathers imagined for us. And the women's suffrage movement has been part of that history in getting us to the place where we really want to be as a representative democracy. So I thank you all for being part of that. I look forward to celebrating more and to being part of marches and efforts up on Beacon Hill with all of you. So thank you for being here today. I don't think Mark and I have really leveraged So we're ready for the main event. But as Representative Gavea said, 100 years of women voting, 100 years of our participation in democracy across the country, but our work goes on. Getting the vote was an important step on the march toward fully participatory democracy but it's just a step and we have to keep working every day. So with that, I would like to introduce Nancy Bucus, who will tell us about our speaker. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my husband tells me I should say how this happened. <laughs> and then I'll say a few words about it. Uh, how did this all come about? Uh, last spring at the state convention, uh, the uh, Cape Ann League was out to say what was exciting at, in their territory. And they spoke about Laura and how excited they were because she had just spoken to them and made many of them cry. Uh, she is a wonderful speaker, and so uh, I asked if I could be helpful, and she said, yes, you could. <laughs> you could help us make a trailer, uh, a trailer that will advertise the musical that Laura has written. And so uh, my friend and I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and watched the most amazing group of people just gather vocalists from all over Nashville. Everybody in Nashville is a vocalist. <laughs> and they all sang together and harmonized with what, one day's rehearsals, yep. something like that. And we were thrilled and we cried. Uh, and uh, so you will see that very short uh, video, which is also called the trailer, uh, halfway through uh, Laura's yep. talk and, and, and see why we were so upset. So excited. Uh, and uh, so we're hoping to get Laura and her group to come to Boston. And uh, she's going to need some help from all of us to arrange that. OK, onward. <laughs> Laura Harrington, award-winning playwright, lyricist, and librettist, winner of the 2008 Evelyn Award for Most Promising Librettist in American musical theater, has written dozens of plays, musicals, operas, and radio plays, which have been widely produced across the US, Canada, and abroad, in venues ranging from Off-Broadway to Houston Grand Opera. She taught playwriting at MIT, where she was honored with the Leviton Award for Excellence in Teaching, her novels include Alice Bliss by Penguin, uh, and that was the uh, winner of the Massachusetts Book Award in Fiction, and a catalog of birds uh, published by Europa, and uh, she's writing now a new novel called Clear Water. Laura is a member of the Cape Ann Massachusetts League of Women Voters, and I now introduce her to you. <laughs> Thank you. You get to keep that. I do. Because okay. I, whoops. I'm going to get wired up here. Give me one little second so everybody can hear me. There we go. 
Okay, how's that? Great. We're good? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, good morning. <laughs> and thank you to Nancy Bucus and the Concord Carlisle League of Women Voters for inviting me to come here and speak with you today. I have another huge thank you to Ryan Bucus for making sure that we have audio and video, and he has done <laughs> the most amazing job. Um, I waited to put this on because we're also filming this, and I'm hooked up with another mic for, for the cameraman. Um, I also want to introduce you to Kathleen O'Brien, who traveled here from Nashville to be with us today. <laughs> Kathleen is the amazing person who commissioned Perfect 36 when she was the CEO of Tennessee Performing Arts Center. And and she has been our champion ever since. She has recently retired, but she's not retired at all. She is uh, working with us as our producer, um, and uh, her support could not be more important to this project. I'd like to begin with a quote from Carrie Chapman Catt. As the leading character in the musical, Perfect 36, when it looks as if the 19th Amendment will not pass, Catt rallies the suffragists saying, Words are all we have. They're all we've ever had to change men's minds. We all know the story of the ratification, or we think we do. There's a lot of noise about it right now as we approach the 100th anniversary. But for most of the last century, this moment in history was forgotten, or ignored, or dismissed, or trivialized. Academic publishers are scrambling right now to get a paragraph or two into high school <laughs> textbooks where there is rarely, and I mean almost never, a mention. Here are some things you might not know, although I bet everybody in this room does. <laughs> it took 800 legislative campaigns over 72 years to bring the amendment to a vote. Generations of women, black and white, worked tirelessly on this issue. Delaware was supposed to be the 36th and final state to ratify, but Delaware voted no. And with time running out, states were refusing to vote at all. Governor Roberts of Tennessee, some say he was prodded by President Wilson, finally called a special session. The Suffs needed to win Tennessee or start all over again. And the odds of winning in Tennessee, a Southern conservative state, were long indeed. It was hotter than hell in Nashville that August in 1920. Grumpy legislators called away from their farms and families arrived in the Capitol, bunking at the Hermitage Hotel across the street from the State House. Local and national press were out in force. And suffragists, anti-suffragists, and their leaders poured in from all over the country. Carrie Chapman Catt from her home in New York City, and Josephine Pearson, leader of the anti-suffs from her home nearby. Gardens throughout Nashville were stripped of their roses as suffs carried and distributed yellow roses and antis red. <laughs> <coughs> Lobbyists from every state of the union converged in Nashville. The whiskey ring wanted prohibition, repealed, and viewed women as their natural enemy in this regard. <laughs> the textile manufacturers, the railroad lobby, and more, each concerned that women, if they got the vote, would rewrite child labor laws and reform both working conditions and working hours. They arrived with lots and lots of money to spend to sway the vote. The hospitality suite, which was on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel, are you guys getting a lot of pop? Is this too close to me? Yeah. It's okay. Um, was open 24 hours a day. You needed to pass just to get onto the eighth floor. No women were allowed, of course, and bootleg whiskey flowed night and day. <laughs> Here's a snippet of dialogue from the musical among the lobbyists in the hospitality suite. Right now, we know what the vote costs us. Figured pretty close. But who knows if women can be bought? <laughs> well, if they can, that's going to cost us. And if they can't be bought, that's going to cost us even more. <laughs> The night before the vote, Seth Walker, Speaker of the House, and a staunch suffrage supporter, turned tail and went over to the antis. 
He quit politics immediately after the vote and became vice president of one of the railroads. <laughs> Joe Hanover, the first Jew to serve in the Tennessee legislature, left politics to return to his private law practice, but ran for office again and was reelected just so that he could fight for suffrage. He and Walker had worked long hours together in the months leading up to the vote. Walker's 11th hour betrayal appeared to be the death blow to the Suff cause. Votes were bought and sold sometimes several times over. <laughs> Pro-suffrage legislators received telegrams telling them that a family member was ill or dying and they were desperately needed at home. Suffs were sent to the train platforms to keep waffling legislators from leaving town. The suffragists were also slandered, mocked, attacked. They were characterized as she-men, she-wolves, <laughs> immoral and promiscuous. One legislator instructed another, you and I represent, represent the mothers at home tenderly rocking their babies in their cradles. We do not and never will represent the low neck, high skirt variety of women you see here. <laughs> Carrie Chapman Catt was subjected to personal attacks, smear campaigns, ugly political cartooning, and death threats. There were so many threats against her life in Nashville, she was unable to leave her hotel room. <clears throat> what was at stake? The fundamental democratic right to have a voice, a vote, and a voice. The night before the vote, Catt, who characterized Nashville as the ugliest fight of her life, told the Suffs, most of whom had not slept in days, that there was only one thing left to do, pray. Mm -hmm. To give you the idea of what all this sounded like at the time, here's one of the legislators casting his vote in the musical. This text is taken verbatim from the debates that led up to the vote. And his name was Representative Weldon. I do not believe that the good women of Tennessee want the ballot. But even if they did, the question which we legislators must decide cannot be determined by what women want, but by what they ought to have. <laughs> Another legislator speaks up, that's right. Weldon continues, Eve wanted to eat the apple, but because of that disobedience, God placed woman in the home with her husband to rule over her. Yes, sir. <laughs> if any are disposed to find fault with this position, they are disposed to complain of the will of God Almighty and not of the will of man. And that is just what Mrs. Cat and the leaders of women's suffrage are doing. I vote nay. The amendment was passed by the slimmest possible margin, a single vote. Harry Byrne, the youngest legislator at 24 or 23, had been wearing the red roses of the antis and had voted twice to table the amendment, which would have killed it. But when he arrived in the chamber that August morning, he had a letter in his pocket. Dear son. Yeah. <laughs> Hurrah. <laughs> Hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I have been watching to see how you stand, but have not noticed anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. <laughs> Harry Byrne changed his vote and the course of history. For his efforts, he was chased out of the House chamber and escaped onto the roof of the State House in fear for his life. So what is my relationship to this story? In 1995, while I was at the Bunting Institute writing about Joan of Arc, I got a call from the artistic director of Tennessee Repertory Theater. Mac Perkle had a project he wanted to talk to me about, and he wanted to travel to Cambridge to meet me. I've worked all over the country in theaters large and small, and no artistic director had ever wanted to meet me before deciding whether we would work together or not. Mac and Kathleen O'Brien at Tennessee Performing, Performing Arts Center wanted to commission a musical about the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which would be the cultural centerpiece of Tennessee's 200th birthday. 
in May of 1996. For their 100th, you probably already know this, they built a replica of the Parthenon. So I, I felt that I was in very august company. <laughs> Mac said that he wanted a team of women writers for the show to write the book, the lyrics, and the music. I told him I wanted to write both the book and the lyrics, uh, kind of pushy our first meeting. And when he told me our timeline, which was less than a year, I, needed, I knew I needed a composer I could work with quickly and whom I trusted. So I asked for the composer Mel Marvin. He and I had just spent an incredible year collaborating on Joan of Arc. Mac agreed to my request and then hired all female designers. Lights, costumes, and set. I was quickly learning that Mac Perkle was one of the highest integrity individuals I would ever have the good fortune to work with, and that, when it came to this story, he was a man with a mission. Mac had been raised and educated in the state of Tennessee, elementary, high school, college, and had never heard about Tennessee's role in the 19th Amendment, never known of the historic men and women who had dedicated their lives to this cause. When he was about 30 years old, his high school librarian ran into him at an event, pulled him aside and said, I've got a story for you. That was the spark that became Perfect 36. We began work on the musical in June of 95. I spent two weeks in the Tennessee archives learning about the events of the principal players. We knew we would be performing at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, a theater with 2,500 seats and a 52-foot proscenium arch. That's about as big as it gets, but it was a big cast, 45 characters, and a big story. I wrote furiously throughout that summer, and then we had a table read of the first draft in Nashville in late September. Actors read the script while Mel Marvin played and sang the six or seven songs we had written. At our meeting immediately following the read-through, I told Mac and Mel that we needed to scrap what we had and start over. Let me tell you, an admission like this <laughs> can only occur in an atmosphere of trust, and it would not have been remotely surprising if Mac, who was both our producer and director, had released me, in other words, fired me. <laughs> if the size of the task and the time frame was daunting in June, starting over in late September for an opening night in May looked nearly impossible. But we had learned something critically important from this failure, as one always does. The earnest, hardworking suffs were boring. The antis and all those misbehaving legislators and lobbyists were having all the fun. <laughs> we agreed to sleep on it and reconvene in the morning. I was sorely tempted to walk away. The task seemed monumental. Was it even possible? By 9.30 the next day, we decided to go forward. By 10, we were set up in a conference room at the Hermitage Hotel where all the drama had occurred with great big sheets of newsprint. The three of us vowed not to leave that room until we had storyboarded the entire show from opening number to finale. It took three days <clears throat> to outline every scene, song, and character arc. We knew who was where, what they were doing, and how each scene built our story and led to a song. We were able to salvage most of the characters from the original draft, but discovering humor, a musical is an entertainment first and foremost, allowed us to build a new and better show. In January of 96, we reconvened in Nashville with a completed script and half of the songs finished. <clears throat> While Mac rehearsed the actors and the actors learned the music we'd finished, Mel and I had a punch list of songs to write. There were eight numbers on that list, almost half the show, and somehow we were knocking them off one by one, sometimes more than one a day. Another revision followed. We finished that punch list of songs. The sets and costumes were being designed and built while we were still writing. Rehearsals began the 1st of April. The orchestrator and copyist were working around the clock to get the score ready. Opening night was a very special kind of thrill as we all raced to the finish line. Audiences were terrific, reviews were great, including Variety, which gave us national exposure. We were invited to present the show in New York City that September at the National Alliance of Music Theater, the annual meeting of all regional theaters who produce musicals. <clears throat> the reading in New York could not have gone better. Over and over, we heard, it's the best show I've ever seen at this conference. But no one was stepping forward to produce the show. Too big, we heard. 45 characters, are you kidding? A 65-year-old female lead? 
<laughs> unheard of. Then a Broadway producer, one of those slightly seedy, seedy older guys in a pinstripe suit, <laughs> leaned in close enough for a kiss, put his hand on my arm and asked, why would anyone be interested in this story? <laughs> Dismissing me and the show in eight words, which boiled down to, who cares? The musical sat on our shelves for the next 20 years. Until 2016, when I realized that the 100th anniversary was only four years away. I called Mac and Mel, suggested we have a reunion with our cast in Nashville, take a look at our bootleg video of the production, and have a discussion about whether we should try to do a reading or reenact the vote for the centenary. A weekend, I was thinking, a couple of days rehearsal, no big deal. We gathered at Mac's home to share a meal with our cast and watch the video. The show was not perfect, no show is, <clears throat> but it was astonishingly good and shockingly relevant. The question, who cares, had been wiped out by Hillary Clinton's presidential run. Over the next few years, Harvey Weinstein et al., the Me Too movement, Clinton's loss, and Kavanaugh's confirmation against, uh, created a very different climate for a story of women working against the odds to have a voice and a vote and a say in their government. Since then, we have been revising and reimagining the show. Characters have been cut. New songs have come and gone. Both the opening and the finale have been rewritten. The heart of the show remains the same, but we've pulled it into the 21st century. We had our first reading of the new material in Nashville in January 2018 in the ballroom of the Hermitage Hotel. A very successful Kickstarter campaign funded that workshop. It went so well, we followed up with a reading in New York City in July. It's always really scary to bring a show to New York, the toughest audience in the world. But I saw something in New York I never expected to see. Not only were people engaged and energized, they were deeply, <coughs> deeply moved. <clears throat> there were tears and cheers and laughs and a standing ovation, which I have never experienced at a workshop. Suddenly, this story of scrappy women and men fighting against corruption and for a voice was not only relevant, but unexpectedly emotional. I'd like to share two numbers from the show with you. Sharon, where's Sharon? If you have those little pieces of paper to pass out to people, and we're gonna pass out the words to the lyrics in case there's anything that you can't hear. Um, so I'm gonna share these two songs with you, and then we're gonna play the video so you all have a chance to see it. Um, and let me just set them up. The first is the final song in act one. We're in the hospitality suite for a black tie celebration and award ceremony. <clears throat> in a stunning reversal, Seth Walker, Speaker of the House, has deserted the suffs and gone over to the antis. He's presented with a cash award. His new job as Vice President of the Birmingham and Nashville Railroad is announced. For the men in the room, legislators and lobbyists alike, victory is so close, they can taste it. This song is called We Love the Power. And the world of this song is 1920. And I'll also suggest it's the world of today. What's been passed out, however, is woman's voice, not, okay. not power. So. so Sharon also has the lyrics to power, which are coming around in just a moment. I'll get those going. Here we go. Those guys, beautiful. Thank you, Sharon. No, it's, it's in the way. Sure. That's great. Thank you. In rooms where we hide. No, it's good. It's good. It's perfect. It starts slow. It starts low. Yeah, we can go higher. In rooms where we joke. Cause I can blow them up though. 
In rooms where we trade, in rooms where we stray with women. We love the power, we love the power. We love the way we play the game. We love the power, we love the power. Troubles. Everybody's reading a woman's voice. So, wrong the They're trying to find that voice in that. Nothing's perfect. We love the power and we know we're doing What you have passed out is wrong this song. Stop reading. <laughs> no, they've got it. Listen. We've got power. I'm sorry if you didn't get the right lyric sheet, but they're they're coming around, and you'll be able to see those. Great. All right. A woman's voice opens the second act, and I'd like you to picture a half moon runway that extends beyond the proscenium and into the audience. In silence, twenty-five women file on stage and fill that half moon. They have taken off their jackets, and in their dresses, the suffs and antis are indistinguishable. We can no longer tell which side they are on. Behind them, on either side of the stage, are two men wearing tuxedos from the night before in the hospitality suite. They carry red silk sashes draped over their arms. As the song progresses, the women are gagged one by one. Until at the very end, the last woman is cut off mid phrase. Yes, please. And then in silence, the women file off the stage. Uh, wait. Oh, here it is. It's ready to go. And what's happening? Sorry. My technical director just left the room. <laughs> Hmm. <coughs> so, Ryan, we also need to play the song, and I'm not doing very well on that. <laughs> I know I should have just pressed a button, but I pressed the wrong button, probably. Oh, his voice, okay. That should be Ryan. Oh, there we go. Here we go. <coughs> a woman's voice welcomed you into the world. Thank you. A woman's voice sang you to sleep. A woman's voice guided your growing, gave you glowing memories to keep. A woman's voice has held your 
secrets a woman's voice has shared her own a woman's voice gave you a start captured your heart when you were Closing, and with a huge thanks to Nancy and Ryan, I'd like to play the video teaser that we've created as we work to get Perfect 36 on stage this fall to both celebrate the 100th anniversary of ratification and help get out the vote. Here we go. 2020 is right around the corner. And you know what that means. 
Because it's an election year. Yikes. So ponder this. What if women couldn't vote in 2020? Had it not been for a single vote changed from nay to yay in 1920, the history of women in politics would have been very different. Ratification of the 19th Amendment came down to a single vote. And it was cast by a 23-year-old from Nyota, Tennessee. This historic moment is coming to the stage. Perfect 36 is a theatrical event likely to feel like deja vu all over again. We will keep the reins of power. You know we're itching for a fight. And while we hold the reins of power, it's hard times, am I right? Told by 40 singers, actors, and musicians, Perfect 36 celebrates the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, reshaping the arc of America's future. The 72-year suffragist struggle to gain the right to vote for half the nation was a force to reckon with. Hundreds of women arrested in front of the White House, countless marches across the country. How long, how long, how long do we have to wait? How many weeks and months and years? How many lifetimes will it take? How many lies? How many bribes? How many broken bones? How long, how long do we have to wait? The ratification of the 19th Amendment stalled at 35 states. And that brings us here to the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, where the drama unfolded among a menagerie of legislators from all around the counties, heroic suffragist leaders from around the country, anti-suffragist leaders, and high-profile business lobbyists. We ain't gonna be, no, we ain't gonna be, no, we ain't gonna be no perfect. And in the heat of that southern summer, illegal whiskey flowed freely, Jim Crow racism flourished. And the promise of a vote changed like the wind in an ironic scenario that gave men the power to make the decision about women's rights. Just close your eyes. I'm worried about men. Put your head on my chest. I'm worried about many things. Concentrate on the moonlight. I'm worried about Democrats. I'll take care of the rest. And Republicans. When it comes to romance. Can't you see? I want of the best. What's bothering me? We hope to premiere Perfect 36 in August of 2020 and then take the show on, on the, the road. road. To do this, we need your help. So we want you to do what the lobbyists do influence the future with, with your, your money. money. After all, it only happens once in a hundred years. So bust up, ladies, show them you ain't no more than dumb. Time to take that iron fist right out of the velvet glove. So help us bring Perfect 36 to Tennessee and beyond in 2020. Thanks for your support. It all comes down to this right Headlines are reminding us almost every day that a single vote can make all the difference. We recently received a matching grant of $500,000.
If you or anyone you know would like to help us make this happen, please get in touch. I've left my business cards on your tables. Our website just launched yesterday. It's still a work in progress, but the video is available there as well as a number of the songs. So if there was someone, if you wanted to see it again or there was someone you'd like to share it with, it's you can just send them a link to the website. Um, and I'd love to take your questions. And Kathleen O'Brien, who was our original commissioner and producer of the show, is also here to answer questions. Um, and I just want to thank Nancy and Ryan again and the League of Women Voters. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening and giving a damn. Um, and then I just also wanted to mention that if you'd like to be on our mailing list or if you would like us to contact you, my husband, David Rosen, put your hand up, sweetheart. Um, we'll have a, pa a pad of paper and, uh, and some pens and he'd be happy to take your names. You will also be able to reach us through our website if you'd like to be in touch. So any questions? See a hand in the back. The, the question is that, that it looks as though this is something that high schools would really get sink their teeth into, which is absolutely correct. The way this works in our business is that we get a fully produced production, and then a licensing company will license it for colleges, universities, and high schools to be able to do it. And that um, the cost of that are, I believe, at a, something of a sliding scale. Um, so it's not out of, the, out of reach for schools to be doing this. And of course, that's exactly what we would love to see happen. Um, and one of our ideas for the production of this um, is that in each city where we go, we would have a, a solid core cast of 25, let's say, and then we would add 10 to 15 students from local universities as our chorus. Um, and we believe we could have an adequate rehearsal for the main cast, but we believe we could rehearse in the chorus in a day or two. So that's something we would love to do. Yes, um, Julie. I noticed that you, uh, there was a reference at the end about the cast musicians, et cetera, being 40. Is that, is that the, the hard total for both the pit, essentially, and then who's on stage? Um, they're for, uh, she said she noticed that we were talking about uh, a cast of 40. Um, it is a cast of 40 and a band between four and eight. It's a relatively small band. And I know that's a huge number. Um, it's also what makes this show so unique and so powerful. And then just to give you an example, if you try to put the legislative process on stage, and that's only men, right, at that time, you subtract half of your cast, and you're left with, if you had 20 people do it, you're left with 10 men, five on each side, and suddenly we don't understand what a big deal this was. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that it's so big. It's also big so that you can hear the thrill of all of those voices. Um, it's quite anthemic in terms of some of the numbers in the show. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, thank you, Ryan. This is a wonderfully powerful powerful musical and um, I was wondering if there's any way to get it recorded and have it on TV because I think that would be yes. the best way to yes. reach so yes. many people. I completely agree with you and I think one incredible outcome would be if we were able to do one of our events and have that uh, recorded so it was available to everyone, um, not just recorded but filmed. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room has contacts with uh, important people at PBS, but we would love to talk to anyone. Um, and uh, again, that kind of requires somebody having the energy and the um, perseverance to just keep knocking on that door, um, which is how all of this has happened up to this point. Um, we're, we are really just a few individuals trying to make this happen. We don't have a big um, structure behind us. We don't have a big administration behind us. So we're in the process of creating that. Yes, I see a question right there. So, Freddie, go ahead. Not yet. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you. That was incredibly moving. I, don't, I expect many others had to have tears in their eyes watching this. So thank you thank so you. much for producing this. 
um, and writing it and all of that. Um, well, one of the things that occurs to me that I think is wonderful is you're highlighting Carrie Chapman Cat, who often does not get a lot of play and yep. was so critical, of course, to the League of Women Voters right. as well. Are you able to build that in at all? And I'm also interested in um, in whether you address the conflict and the and the efforts of Alice Paul and the National Women's Party in that whole piece. Absolutely. Um, Carrie is uh, is one of our three main characters. Um, we have three main characters who you saw singing the song, How Long Will It Take? Um, how many broken bones, how many lies and bribes. So there's Carrie. There's Nancy Siders, who is head of housekeeping at the Hermitage Hotel and an avid suff suffragist. And the third character is a young woman named um, Mary Parker French, who is a fictional character who is a cub reporter trying to get off the home page and onto the city page. And the three of the, I, I won't say too much more about that, but the way that we address both racism and the more um, radical suffs is, of course, some of the radical suffs came to Tennessee for that final fight. And so there was, um, uh, there was conflict among the SUFs about what were the appropriate things to be doing, and the radical SUFs wanted to be out there much more than the more strategic SUFs, if I can say so. And so Nancy is both our, uh, Nancy Siders is both joining our women the first time they're in the war room. And um, there are other, there's another woman who is also on the staff at the hotel, because we have to be both true to the period about where black people were at this time, as well as how much they were doing and how hard they were working. So we do have those two women who are telling us about their stories and what they're doing, as well as some of the suffs on stage who are not comfortable with this. Because the um, more radical stuffs are saying, fantastic, come on, come in, sit down. And s some of the stuffs are like, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Um, and so we try to dramatize that uh, racial divide um, and uh, as well as bring all of the voices of the suffs from the most conservative to the most radical into the mix um, and to give, uh, give voice to what the black women around the country were doing because we referenced them in several moments. So we can't, we can't leave that incredible story out of this incredible story. Um, the man with the microphone is in charge. <laughs> Can you right, mention um, that Carrie Chapman Cat became uh, the first so head of the Regal Women's Office? Uh, in your musical, I was curious if you could share with us some of your source materials that might be of interest to others to read. Um, well, the uh, how I wish Elaine Weiss had written her book, A Woman's Hour. 30 years ago, um, because at 30 years ago, we were literally digging through pages upon page of uh, archival material at, in the Tennessee archives. So, and then there was another critical book written by, her last name is Yellen, I'm gonna forget her first name, two women co-authored a book about Tennessee suffrage, which was incredibly important and useful to us, where they had gathered a lot of that uh, archival material and photographs, which is, where we then had our beginning to try to um, figure out who these wonderful characters were and then go to other sources to find out what we could. There is more being published now than was available to us in 1996. So that's another way that the story and the revisions are changing in terms of how much we continue to learn um, as more information comes to light about these amazing women. Uh, Ryan. The book group here at Concord, Carlisle, Easy Women's Voters, read The Women's Hour, yeah. and it was great. And one of the things that really struck me was how things don't change. Um, the anti-suffragettes, to me, are all the women who did not vote for Hillary Clinton. Yep. They're all the women who support corruption in government. They're all, you know, I'm just wondering how you address this in the play, because to me, that's one of the most compelling things about the vote. Um, I think one of the ex one of the things I've seen as we've presented this in front of people is that the audiences like yourselves are really smart and they see this same kind of thing playing out in 1920 and they're going, this is happening right now, um, which is part of what gives it its power because we're we're recognizing that and we're saying, 
just like the SUFs, we need to address it. We've got to do something. Um, so I think if we, um, it's never fun to be in the theater and have somebody lecture at you, right? <laughs> and tell you what you should think. Um, it, 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 for, it drives me out of the theater, to tell you the truth. But when you can tell a story that provokes that thinking, then something different happens inside of people in terms of what they're, what they're experience, experiencing. And that's, for me, the power of theater, especially musical theater, because these songs get into your head and you can't forget them. Yes, go ahead. Coming back to you in a minute. No. It's on. I'll really shop on. Okay. Um, I wonder if we can hear from Kathy O'Brien um, from the Nashville perspective. What is happening in Nashville to try to get this um, piece of theater launched? Stand up, Kathleen. And just so you know, what we were looking at um, was from the original production in Nashville. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Well, thank you again for coming here um, and, and allowing us to uh, share this great production. Um, and I'm going to get to your question in a second, but what I would like to tag on to something that Laura said from the last question is how empowering art can be, particularly musical theater, to engage a community in discussion. And then stuff happens from that. So not once we figure out where we're going to go and who we're going to be partnering with, there is going to be a, a, a tandem effort to engage whoever we're working with to be out in the community to do some enhancement programs, some community conversations, so that you're not being lectured. And so that things do bubble up and you're seeing a resemblance of themes from yesteryear to today and how unfortunately we still need to tell the story because it's not holding truth. It's not, it's not making change after so many years. So what is Nashville doing? Um, this is where it premiered, as you know, back in 1996. And thank, thankfully, Laura has dusted it off with the team, contemporized it, and made it relevant uh, to be able to celebrate and, and remind people about how difficult this really was and be entertained at the same time. Whenever I hear this, the song, A Woman's Voice, it's emotional, and it opens the second act right after you've heard that song, Power, which is just a collision of two songs. Uh, we, when I was president at TPAC, and I stepped down uh, in the end of June, uh, we had talked about a partnership with, with the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, that organization, to be able to present it there. We now have new leadership there. We've got a lot of different things going on in that center with different kinds of priorities and with different types of um, resources that they don't have available right now. And so we were hopeful that we could present it at TPAC and we thought we were going to, and that just didn't work out. So we are, we believe in it. There, there, nothing has changed about the passion and the steadfastness of wanting to get this up on stage. So I said to Laura, Mac, and Mel, you have me, let me help you with this. So what I'm spending my time, and Mac is as well, to try to talk to as many people as we possibly can in Tennessee and in, in this area. Um, and then we hope, uh, and there have been some discussions in Washington, D.C., but what it's boiling down to is trying to find people who believe in this enough that it can't not happen. It has to happen. It's, it's a matter of, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, so this, this change in, in the partnership uh, where we did lose our dates um, doesn't mean we can't get them back, but we lost the partnership. So we're working very hard to find people who, in various sectors of the, uh, the, the nation, Tennessee, Massachusetts, and DC, to help us make this happen. We're talking to venues in those areas, uh, and we're trying to raise the resources to make it happen. And some of that's chicken and egg. But I think to answer your question, the, the greatest effort is coming from Mac and I, who both live in, in Tennessee, to try to make these connections. Uh, women like yourself, um, to be able to rally for the cause and help us get this going. We, we want to be able to do it 
surrounding August and right up and in Nashville school opens like August 2nd they, they start they don't wait till Labor Day like up here so <laughs> August is a tough time but um, and there's a perfect 36 society in Nashville that we're also working with um, to try to see how we can uh, work together with their help Okay, that's all. It strikes me that not only high school, but colleges, especially the league, has got a huge effort to get people registered and get out to vote. I went to a woman's college. I think that's a sweet spot okay, for this. So sure hope that we can help you make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. What, well, while we're waiting for the microphone, when we did the staged reading in New York, we invited the League of Women Voters to come, and they actually registered people at the staged reading, including some of the actors. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, they got to vote too, right? Particularly if they're in a show about voting. I know. <laughs> yep. I got a green light. Um, I have a couple of questions. Yep. The first one is, how much money do you need to raise? Uh, we to, to get the first production up and be able to take it uh, somewhere else, which is going to cost more money, mm -hmm. we're going to need to raise at least a million dollars. Mm -hmm. We've got half of that, but it's a matching grant. My, my next question, and Nancy's probably already thinking about this, um, the League's National Convention is in June. <laughs> and... It seems to me it would be a great place for a pre-production if you're not ready to roll it out yeah. until August, but a pre-production showing of this, which then gets every state league involved across the nation. So you have a, a captive audience. And uh, I'm just throwing it out there, Nancy. Um, <laughs> and we have a very active, I'm not part of it, but we have a very active book club here. And the, the book that you mentioned, maybe they might take it on to come up with reading that, notes, things like that to kind of coordinate. Great. I'm not giving you any, any work, Anne. But um, anyway, those, are, married, those yeah, are just some <laughs> thoughts. And those are, those are great ideas. I think part of our challenge is the timeline that we're dealing with. Um, we, I think there's a life for Perfect 36 for many years. There's, I mean, how many times have you seen 1776? There's a life for those shows for many, many years. Our, our challenge is to have something, and it could, we're not sure what that, the scope of the production will be because the larger the scope, the more the money. Um, and given the time frame, um, we're, we may be dealing with something that is more like a theatrical concert where all the actors are off book, they're in costume, there are props, there are some sets, but it's not the huge sets that you've seen in some of these productions. That's going to be tough to do, and that's going to be more than a million dollars. But the, the goal is to get this beautiful story up on stage by August, September, the, the fall time. So. Um, before the vote. Before before this incredibly important vote in November. And you'll notice that we will not tell anybody how to vote. It's vote. We care about the second question, the first question. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, it, it's two things. D, you were, you're, you, we were channeling each other. Um, we have read The Woman's Hour in our reading group. I mean, that was the book that we've just finished. And that made watching what you were doing particularly poignant for those of us who read it. Because, wow. Um, and Elaine Weiss spoke last year, two years ago, at the National uh, League. Huh. I, I think all of us should be writing the National League, not leaving it just to Nancy, but we should all be writing the National League. Send a little note saying, hey, we've just seen the most amazing program, and we think it should be featured at the at the um, the the, the uh, mm -hmm. program in in, in June, that's June twenty fifth to June twenty seventh. I just looked it up. The Jet Blue had a sale. And I was going to get my plane tickets. <laughs> um, and so it's in it, where is it, it again? Where is it's in Washington, Washington. Yeah. And I think we should all go home, read this, write a note, and say, "Oh my gosh, this would be fantastic," um, and then get everybody you know to do the same. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Nancy wants me to make sure that everyone remembers that the League of Women Voters grew out of the unbelievable organizing that Carrie Chapman Catt did to get the amendment done. Um, so first president too. <laughs> Oh, just picking up on the um, television where you could yes. reach such a huge and important audience. Um, how realistic would a June 25th performance be in for the meeting on June 25th <clears throat> and picked up by national TV at the same PBS or something like that in Washington? I mean, you're looking at August. June is only a few months away. Is that realistic, um, a stage performance? It would be tough, and it would oh. it would spend our budget yeah. um, you got to do money, it there. Would you do it? Um, Two million, three million. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nodding my head. I mean, money talks. Money makes some Hold things on. possible. I'm going to let, actually, I'm, I'm just the writer. <laughs> and I'm turning this over just to a fabulous writer. producer. <laughs> I, I think we have to change our strategies, is what we have to do. Um, as she said, the, uh, that leaves us the budget. A strategy surrounding that, that we haven't really uh, talked about, could be that that's where the budget goes in hopes of that generating future shows. Uh, but it would be expensive. It, 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 it could be, uh, we could talk about the, the scope, the level of the production in terms of how large is the production budget? Is that email address? But um, with that many people in the cast, um, and and one of the things that we I don't know that we touched on nope. was in the premise of going into the various communities is also to engaging um, uh, theatrical students, musical students, to help supplement the the yep. choir and the chorus. Yep. Um, it, it's not just about um, preaching to the choir. It's about engaging new audiences as well. And as we know, either whatever side of the stage you're on, uh, if you're in the show or if you are sitting in the audience, uh, what you see, what you feel, what you experience, and that's what it's all about, what you see, feel, and experience, uh, will change you. It is life-changing. I've seen it happen many times. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Julie. I've asked them before, if, if there's a moment, Uh, Freddie Kay with Women's Suffrage Celebration Coalition. A couple things come to mind. I don't know how many of you know, but this past January 1st, on New Year's Day, at the Rose Bowl Parade, there was a suffrage float. Oh, wow. And I had the honor of marching, representing Massachusetts, as one of the hundred suffragists behind wow. the float. Um, I mention that because um, that's another place. There were women, from the 36 states were all represented, wow. et cetera. So there's a, that organization, Pasadena Celebrates 2020, is another place where there are women who have gathered who all feel this passionately. Yep. And I will tell you, it was wonderful to march because the people, there were a million people at this parade. There were 5.5 um, miles of walking and all around the route, people were thrilled. They were cheering us, women putting their hands to their hearts, men giving us the thumbs up, everybody gets it about voting. Um, so that's just another place to be talking about where we can reach out to people. Great. Um, Massachusetts, is, the coalition is also involved with a nationwide effort to put up markers. They're doing roadside markers throughout the, throughout the country that can be on your phones. And that's through um, National Women's History Group and TRAIL. So that's another piece I'm happy to Beautiful. tell you about. And you mentioned June 25th. I have to add, that's the anniversary. Massachusetts was the eighth state to ratify. Um, so that will be there. Uh, finally, I'll just add quickly, I've handed out pens to Suffrage 100 MA. And somebody was asking about resources. We have books listed under our resources, movies listed, all kinds of things that I encourage everybody to take a look at the website. and. Um, because you'll see resources there, that, including, of course, uh, the Women's Hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Please, everyone, for thank our wonderful speaker.
okay. Um, oops. There we go. Okay. Um, I was just asked to remind everyone that there is a matching grant that they only get if they match it. So um, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I think you've all learned a tremendous amount, and it was a wonderful program. Um, Please join us at future events. Um, your, the calendar that you should have received has some local uh, events regarding the 100th anniversary. On the back, there is a rather um, eccentric timeline that I put together of some, some national and some local events related to the history of women voting and the founding of the League. Um, I would also like to remind you that we have yellow roses which you may take until they're gone. Um, Cindy, who came up with the Yellow Rose design and project, told me to recommend to you that you keep them in your glove box so that you're always ready to put on your Yellow Rose. That's a good one. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers again. And please mingle, talk, and uh, enjoy the rest of the morning.